Welcome to Dear Romance Writer, where three writers who always deliver happily ever afters offer questionable advice for all of your relationship, work, and life problems. I'm Zio Axelrod. And I'm Roan Parrish. Avery's on the road, but we have another episode for you this week, and joining us is one of my favorite people, the author Avon Gale. Avon, welcome. <laughs> Tell everyone about yourself. Um, hello, I'm Avon. Um, I also write under I'm half of the Iris Fox Glove writing team, or Avon Gale. Um, probably a host of other names you could think of would be fine. <laughs> awesome. And several weeks ago, I made like a very, uh, you know, like anytime I produce anything on social media, you know that I put in a lot of like useless and frustrated effort. And so I went to all the useless and frustrated effort to make a video talking about the podcast. And then the entire time I said Avon instead of Avery. Oh no. <laughs> and I just, like, I just didn't, you know, same first two letters, whatever. Yes. And I, I posted the video before I was like, so not the correct. Person at all. <laughs> here you are. <laughs> yeah, here I am. Here I am. And then I appeared. Oh my gosh. Yes. And then you appeared. And what everyone didn't know is when I referred to Avon instead of Avery, Avery became Avon Gale. Yes. Oh gosh, so we're, surprise. We're the same person. No, I'm just kidding. Avery. <laughs> oh, <you're first. clears throat> that's funny. <laughs> what do you what do you have out? What's your latest release or what do you have that's uh that's coming? Um, so my latest release is actually a co-written contemporary MM that just came out, what is today, Thursday? So it came out Tuesday uh, oh, wow. called Eden. It's like a, a small town, uh, second chances romance with a two former um, search and rescue Coast Guard members who had a bit of an incident and then meet up again as tour guides in Alaska. Um, so it's oh. very found family. Um, I actually wrote it with a friend three years ago. And we were getting ready to like kind of think about publishing it in 2020. So that took oh, a look. What happened? What yeah, I know. A couple of things, a couple of things, but um, I have that. And then my fantasy series, the next book is coming out in October. And it's about the God of death, <laughs> totally different subject. The God of death finding his eternal companion with a soldier from an empire who then ends up betrayed. And there's a whole angst. It's the longest book I've ever written. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's 120,000 words at the moment. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and I have a co-writer for that, so it's not just me, but I'm pretty wordy and wow, I'm my poor editor, Marty, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great though. Yes, thank wow. you. Wow, how did I, I, I usually get like a notification when your stuff pops up because you're on my follow thing, but I must have, I've been in the cave all week, so. I, I believe me, I understand. Yeah. All the new releases this week. So sorry for everyone. Well, that's totally, there were so, there were so many, like I saw the list and thought, woof, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, we have a very interesting letter today. We normally, we love to get letters from our listeners. Um, I wish I could say we did that regularly, but they don't write to us enough. And I think it's because they just don't love me, oh, but no. please, write. <laughs> please send us letters. Oh, wait, is that Kitty? Hi, kitty. You guys should go on YouTube and look at the kitty. I would give you the whole body, but I'm in my underwear, so I can't show <laughs> My cat is here too, but she's laying on her back on the rug on my on the floor. <laughs> oh. yeah. Well, you guys, um, please send us your letters and your questions and your comments. You can write us to advice at dearromancewriter.com or come to our DMs or whatever. But this one is from a site called Autostraddle, which I don't even know where I found that, but it popped up and I thought, this one's a really good one, so buckle up. Right after my ex broke up with me, I felt heartbroken and devastated, but proud of myself for the love and generosity that I was capable of. I had no regrets. I had loved her deeply and fully. Three months and two therapists later, I'm beginning to see what friends and family suspected long ago, that she was emotionally and sexually abusive to me. I love her still so much. I know the cruelty she treated me with was only because she had been treated so cruelly by others and turned that inward on herself and I'm a casualty of that but I'm beginning to see my love and empathy as a flaw how can I trust myself again when I know how many red flags I excused away how many second and third and fourth chances I gave how much I sacrificed of my own self-love in the name of loving another is that love or just sickness how can I feel good about any of it now and they didn't sign the letter but we can call them oh my gosh what do you want to call them <laughs> letter writer uh, yeah. I would love to call them late for dinner, hyphenated. Oh boy. <laughs> Edit that out. Okay, late for dinner. <laughs> um, yeah, but this is this touches on a bunch of stuff. So yeah. 
Yeah. And I, it's amazing because I actually was just having a, a conversation a couple of days ago with my oldest dear friend, like child friends since childhood friend. Mm-hmm. And um, they were talking about recently feeling be- betrayed, not betrayed. Uh, yeah. Recently coming to, f- to feel like someone that they loved had like treated them quite badly actually after the fact realizing. Mm-hmm. And we were yeah. just talking about like, how do you separate the relationship that you had, like the good things, the ways you grew and learned from later on realizing that there were also elements of like abuse or lies or something like that. And like how, cause it's not just about like, oh no, this person and this relationship weren't everything that I thought they were. It was like the very sense of love and like self that I got from this person or from this relationship have now been like tainted by realizing yeah. that they are maybe a shitty person and treated me badly. And like, how do you salvage the pieces of like yourself or a relationship or a, or a time that you were going through when they become like, not the vibe that you experienced them with. And I feel like mm-hmm. all of us have experienced that. Uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I feel like this is, I mean, it's, it's a common problem, even if it's not a really like a romantic relationship yeah. that this oh, is yeah. an experience that say. so many people have is looking back and being like huh I didn't suspect that this person was a shitty abusive liar how do I ever trust myself again and mm-hmm. how do I like how do I deal with the fallout of yeah. like where is the choice between thinking like I was naive and I should have known versus I was the person that I was when I lived this experience and I need to find a way to like forgive myself for being for, for genuinely believing that people meant well. And I think it's a yeah. hard, like hard line to walk. Yeah. Cause you I do, do want to believe that people mean well, and you don't want to lose that ability because I feel like that makes yeah. it even harder. The next relationship you have to trust again, but then mm-hmm. when you doubt yourself, even if it's not like, I just was myself in this relationship and then this thing happened. And then another relationship comes along. You're like, well, was it really the other person? What if it was me? And then you get all mm-hmm. the not that I know anything about this, but <laughs> you get all those like self-doubts, like, and you know, you don't, sometimes you don't even realize that something is like, you're having not even like trickery, but like you freak out about something and you're like, oh, is this the same thing it was with this other person? You start you second guessing of, everything. Yeah. You can think yeah. of it like that relationship was this glass of water. This relationship is this glass of water. Like you got to look at them as separate things, but it's hard to do that. Yeah. yeah. Because you do- are the big overlapping middle. Yeah, there's yeah. The, only, the only thing in common is you. So it's easy to blame yourself. But I do love that she says that she's proud of herself for the love and generosity that she was capable of. Because that's that shows me that like she's at least acknowledging that yeah. what she's capable of is not a bad thing. Yeah. So, you know, at the end, she says, you know, how can I trust myself again? Well, well, I mean, you know, it's, it is a sort of a leap of faith. Anytime you get into a relationship or a friendship or anything where you open yourself up to other people. Yeah. yeah. So it's just going to take a while, maybe for that bruise to heal enough for you to open up, you know, they don't have to force, she doesn't have to force herself to open herself up to anyone. There's no yeah. timetable on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I feel like the fact she said she's gone to like two therapists, like this is yeah. somebody who clearly wants to engage with what happened and like how to move forward. Like that's the healthiest, that's like all you can do. If that doesn't work, God knows. (laughs) Not a good answer for the the advice podcast. I don't know. But but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I mean, I think that it's, um, it's super easy also, I think for some of us to move from the feeling of something to the like metacognition about the feeling about the thing. So it's like, okay, well, I felt this way when they said this thing. So maybe I wasn't actually like listening to them. Maybe I was just feeling the way they made me feel in response to them. And it becomes like so far removed that for me anyway, it's like very easy to lose all of the feeling in the, uh, whatever you call it, overthinking. Yeah. Um, and I think to me, that's a phase. So like we all, well, you know, phases of grief and stuff like denial, yeah. rage, acceptance, all of that. Um, I feel like we all, we each have our own, uh, whatever you would call that, like cycle that you move through to get over something. And for me, metacognition is totally a cycle. And it's the, Mm -hmm. it's what, it's the step that I get in when I'm like, 
oh shit, something was going on that I did not know. And now my brain will run the entire course of the relationship back through like a horrible sex ed film strip that I pause (laughs) every time I make a choice or have a feeling and, and like dissect it and figure out how I could have been a better person, where I failed. And when I get stuck in that, then like at the end, I can be like, oh, interesting. Because you know, you can only change yourself. You're not actually making any progress. You're just going through an editing for like, what could I have done to disable the way someone else was going to act? And the answer of course always is nothing. There's nothing nothing you could have done. Probably there are things that you could have done that would have produced different results, but it was always going to be a thing where like, if someone is abusive, if they're a liar, if they're a narcissist, if like, these are things that they have. Um, I mean, those are like neutral, I suppose, because lots of people act different ways when they have those traits, but like nothing that you do would have made up for that person being abusive um and to me the the cut sorry I know I'm like this is like a circle not a line but the to me the step the phase that I reach when I'm in like deep metacognition and realizing that all I'm actually doing is questioning all of my own choices and decisions is I say like oh okay you are looking for a way to make this your fault it's just that you Mm -hmm. have a PhD so you're doing it in an extremely complicated (laughs) theoretical and like (laughs) <laughs> dumb way and once I realized that for myself like that's not everyone's st- stage but once I realized for myself that like all I'm doing is is like marshalling the intense power of my brain to think of really arcane complicated ways that probably everyone else's problems are my fault then I'm kind of like maybe just move on to the next thing probably yeah. Yeah, sounds good. And I think part of it too is that like we do that because we want things. It's hard to think things are out of our control. So if we do that, we're trying to in a way be like, I did this so I can not do it the next time. So if it was Mm -hmm. my fault that it happened this time, and I know it, I can make sure it doesn't happen this next time. But yeah, I mean, it's it's never that easy, is it? (laughs) I'm curious about two things. One, um, if this is a pattern. Mm. Yeah. Relationships because seeing two therapists in three months I don't know she wasn't getting the help she needed from the first or wasn't hearing what she wanted to hear from the mm-hmm. first or whatever it is but but also the fact that her friends and family said something to her during the relationship mm-hmm. and she didn't listen to them yeah so I'm wondering if there's you know there are some people and I'm not saying it's this letter writer but there are some people who have like this sort of martyr complex when it comes to relationships they want to mm-hmm. fix the person that they're with you know, they see the flaws and they're like, oh, but if they just get the right amount of love or if they just get mm-hmm. somebody, you know what I mean? So yeah, I would be curious to know if there were, were other relationships where they felt at the end were like, oh, that wasn't good for me. And I didn't see it at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I also, I mean, one thing that I've learned a lot about in the last couple of years because of a personal experience is um, covert narcissism, which I feel like is really having a, a moment um, <laughs> now that everyone is like, <laughs> not covered in their is having a moment yeah <laughs> everything's having a moment on the internet yeah. but like I do I do kind of feel like during the pandemic when everyone started like working from home stay mm-hmm. spending a lot of time with people they actually got to see their people's patterns with other people in a way that they never got to see them before like you didn't know how your person talked to their boss or their underlings at work yeah. or them at work or how they made oh, call- yeah. phone calls to like the pharmacy or errands and so to me it's like not surprising that the second we started spending a lot of time with the overlapping spheres of people's lives that we started to see these patterns and everyone started to be like interesting I am listening to this person and somehow nothing is ever their fault and I yeah. thought it was not me <laughs> because everything obviously are, always is my fault but it's with other people too and then suddenly they're like wait a second um anyway so I I have been learning about covert narcissism both because of a personal experience that I had with someone who I think is one and also because uh, (laughs) but one of the things that I (laughs) one of the things that I've like learned is that um and this is not just true of covert narcissists but this is how I was introduced to the idea is that like other people assume about you what they would do themselves Mm -hmm. so um, if I assume that someone is telling the truth, it's because I generally tell the truth. If I assume that someone, there are inconsistencies to their stories, but they clearly come from like, like, I mean, there are inconsistencies. I have a terrible memory. If I told three different people the same story, there would probably be differences in my story too and inconsistencies. Right. So it's this attempt to find the benefit of the doubt because all of these, like I try to see someone the way I would see people. And what that also means is that when other people behave ungenerously toward you and like 
think that you're doing something for a bad reason or a shitty reason or whatever, like that, the first thing you have to think is like, are they assuming that about me? Because that is their worldview is that when people do nice things, it's suspicious and it's ego driven. Yeah. yeah. Like when, you know, and I think that like motive. one of, yeah. And one of the hard things in, in going like back over a relationship, like this letter writer is, is you have to, you can't like engage and ask. So you have to go back and be like, yeah. oh, we got in a fight every time I asked a question. And at the time mm-hmm. I was like, I'm being too aggressive. But now I realize I, every time that person was challenged in any way, they like had a complete and total meltdown. So mm-hmm. what do I do with that? Like little by little, you stack up these things that you know about that person in an attempt to like separate out the pieces that are about you that you have any control over and the pieces that are about them and you don't. And like, I think it's just complicated and, and um, you learn more with every relationship, but I do feel really strongly that like, if you were in an abusive relationship, step number one, don't go looking for any of the reasons that you could have stopped it, that it was your fault. Like imagine if your friend was saying to you, I really loved my parents, but they abused me. You know, you wouldn't be like, oh, well, I mean, if you love them, then it was probably fine. Nor yeah. would you be like, oh, they abused you. Do? Child, cut yeah. them off completely with no whatever. You know, like just yeah. think of what yeah. you say to someone else and you would never be so judgmental. People are always harder on themselves than they are on other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially people who are really empathic. <laughs> yeah. And I hope also- that she that she is talking to her friends and family while she's going through this process to see what they saw that she didn't see. Mm Because a therapist is one thing, but to have people who were witnesses to it saying, well, I didn't want to say anything, but that time at that party when this thing happened, you know what I mean? Like there could be some insight there that that she just completely missed. And And sometimes we miss those. I had a friend who, when she got out of a very bad relationship with someone that I just hated, I mean, really disliked him. And Mm -hmm. when they finally did break up, I would think back to like moments that I would hang out with them and like why it made me uncomfortable. And then I felt bad because I'm like, man, I really should have said something sooner myself in a relationship that has nothing to do with me other than it was a really good friend um yeah. but you don't sometimes put all those pieces together until you have until that kind of context yeah. and if I'm doing that as an outsider then like when you're caught up in it I can see just like you cry every time you talk about him why are you still with him but you know that right. wasn't the only experience of him that she had yeah yeah, yeah. we've had this conversation all- about friendships too yeah yeah but we had this conversation about how toxic friends right we've talked about toxic Mm -hmm. friends and I think I've seen that more in that's that realm than I have in the relationship realm I've seen Mm -hmm. a lot of like especially lately there's a lot of like abusive friendship stuff that's come up during the pandemic that I've seen people talk about and it's it's the same sort of thing like when you're trying to hold on to a friendship trying to be the person that that friend needs you to be but you're not allowed to sort of be your full self with them that's a red flag that a lot of people miss Mm -hmm. you know you try to you sort of like mold yourself into this friend that this these people need and it could be like you know a form of their narcissism and you not seeing that they're manipulating you to make you be what they need you to be right whether it's a crutch or a or a cheerleader or a whatever it is yeah I, i wish we talked like just as a society at large more about like friend breakups because from my experience yeah. of like relationships in my life the most painful thing that ever happened to me was a friend breakup and mm-hmm. i've had relation like romantic relationships and that were painful but this one was like particularly the worst feeling one like it hurt me the most and i just don't think like we talk about that as people enough, like as grownups, like how hard it is to make friends when you're an adult. And then if something happens and that friendship, not just like where you gradually like drift away, but if someone like ghosts you or they yeah, yeah. crazy happen to them and then you get kind of like the fallout from it and you never get that closure, it can be really painful um, yep. to experience, especially like online friendships too, which are very valid, obviously. But then yeah. like, if you don't see that person, it's just so many layers of how it can all get like caught up and and then you don't get that closure if you can't find them or, you know, and it can be just as painful, I think. And I just don't think that, I don't see a lot about that. And I kind of wonder yeah. why that is. I totally agree. I mean, I think that like, in some ways there's the super basic thing that like, because so many people are sort of heteronormative once they move into like the, fa- the my family, nuclear family, like part of their life, friendships suddenly start to take a different, like have a different function. And then for those of us who who don't have that 
thing yeah. where like, I'm still here living the same awesome life. I always was not wanting to only hang out with you at, at children's parks, like a creep, uh, you know, <laughs> no hard feelings. Yeah. Like there are so many reasons why these things, uh, fail, but then it's like, they just don't, there's no narrative. I think yeah. of, uh, yeah. there's no narrative script of friend breakup the way there is of romantic relationships, even though I think all of us have had them and all of us know they're really yeah. important. And I, I, so like every time I watch horror movies, um, this is a slight tangent, but Rowan, I know you also love horror movies and they always give the character, usually it's a woman that her backstory is either like she's lost a child or had an abusive or lost relationship. I would sell my literal soul if I haven't already several times over promised it for, you know, various other things like, um, to see a horror movie where like the, the, the backstory or the. I don't even want to call it the tragic backstory, but like the emotional backstory thing that has the main character kind of unsettled is a friend breakup. Mm -hmm. I think that would be so interesting because you just Mm -hmm. never see that. And it's like, I feel like that is something everyone can relate to. Whereas I can understand the concept of I lost a child and that's very upsetting, obviously. I mean, I don't have children, but I'm empathetic enough that I understand that. But I feel like that loss of a friend who just suddenly stopped talking to you or whatever, even if it didn't happen to you since middle school, you, everybody remembers that feeling of carrying like, that wound out. Yeah. And it's like, that would be such an interesting narrative for a grown up horror, like a horror movie, a grown up horror movie, ex- you know, not like those kitty ones, but like <laughs> a horror movie that has adults to see like that. Um, I really want to write a haunted house book that has that premise where like someone's like going through a friend breakup and like a haunted house somehow. I don't know how it would work, but I just never I see that. that. And I think it would give you the same like emotional range that you want from a character that's experiencing, you know, trauma and then these scary things start happening without it always having to be like, this is all that relationship or like people ever experience in life. They miss that whole huge friendship thing. So totally. Did y'all see on uh, Twitter this past week? So sorry to bring Twitter into real life in any way um the the thing that the random dude was like I'm sure it was just a clickbait situation but where I responded to it so it worked uh where he was like I'm concerned about all these people who didn't decide to have children and how like oh, we're all yeah. I responded children. to I see something too. about that yeah, yeah. This week. and I I kind of think it was just you know for the for the clicks or whatever but um it was interesting like I didn't see any of this on my timeline because I follow awesome people. But when I clicked on the original thing and saw a lot of the comments, people were responding like, yeah, they don't know what's about to hit them. Or like, oh yeah, those people think they're so cool, but wait until they die alone. And he's just like reminding me that. Mm -hmm. So he said something like, what are they going to do? Stay hot and go to parties all the time or something like that. That was his... Yeah. yeah, you either have kids yes. or you stay, you're trying to be hot and go to parties. It was yeah. Like, yeah, I'm still hot. I'm going to parties. What about it? Yeah. Hot and going to parties as uh, AKA in my underwear and hanging out at home, which is my favorite kind of party. Yeah, right. <laughs> forever. Um, but yeah, but there like really is, I think this narrative that if you reach us that like everything's a free for all until you reach 40. And that's when you're going to look back on your life and be like, oh, I have not adequately prepared myself for the way that I am going to be devastated, which I think is such an interesting, like, mode of making making choices in the like in a present moment to attempt to ward off any future yeah. unhappiness which I feel like any happy and like self-actualized person that I know understands that like you can make yourself like happy or unhappy in any situation Situations. and you don't actually have to like Hard paranoically imagine your future self and like create a world for them that coddles them and never challenges them like as if our future selves are like tiny tiny babies but I guess maybe that makes sense from someone who has tiny tiny babies I, I you know I am 45 and I have my dream job I have two great partners a beautiful house um I have a ps5 and I can play persona 5 or, you know royal until three in the morning and nobody gets mad at me and I'm not mad about it Shane or whatever that guy's name was Sean <laughs> Like it was, and there were all these people who were in their forties, like me, who are Gen Xers because everyone forgets we exist, who were like, (laughs) nah, dude, I didn't have kids and I'm perfectly happy. And it was like that meme, you know, the one that it's like, sometimes I think I can still hear his voice. I'm right here. It was like that meme. Everyone like ignored, like they ignored every person. They're like, you're just lying. You're just lying. Yeah, you don't yeah. have a family. I do have a family. I have a nice. You're gonna family. be lonely when you get older because you don't have kids. I was like, wow. they're not gonna visit you anyway, buddy. You don't have children to, say, to keep yourself company when you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? No, I'm like, who them. wants to break it to this poor person that like 75 percent of people hate their fam- their parents and don't 
want to uh, hang out with them when they're older. I mean, I, I feel know, lucky. I, I, I'm not I, in that percentage, but most. Yeah, people. no, like I really like, and then we're like, oh, it's just these, these child free people. They don't have a good relationship with their family. Like Those I have a great people. relationship with my family. It's yeah, not bad. I like mine. <laughs> Yeah, I like mine fine. I just, yeah, it was very strange. And he's like, those friends givings are gonna get old fast. Yeah, that's what, thinking, that's what it was. It was like I'm like, just yeah. wait till it's your kids that choose to go to Friendsgiving and they don't come see you for Thanksgiving. Because- I know. I, I had to like I really resisted very hard being like, you know, it's like you're not actually gonna get me with being like, wow, you're gonna be so sad in the future when you're celebrating people murdering indigenous people. You know, in right? Yeah. I'm like, I gotta inform you, sir, that I don't celebrate that holiday, never wanna hang out celebrating that holiday, and that like literally you invalidated any point you might have made by bringing it up that way. Yeah, I would rather hang out on a random Thursday that everybody had the next day off and eat some good food and watch a movie or something with people I liked and if it if I can be with my family great if there's other people it's like you don't have to choose you could have all of these things I don't understand why having a kid is so important but it was very it was a very weird just seeing the people was somebody weird. was like you for sure told a woman she has childbearing hips <laughs> so the original <laughs> I can I was imagine like, the comments right here. Mm, yeah yeah was, he did got kind of roasted so it was the kind yeah. of post where you just like post the popcorn gif and just say i'm just here for the ratio because i'm mm-hmm. sure that <laughs> yes it was it was pretty rough Yeesh. anyway i have no idea how we got on this topic because <laughs> it turns out when you get either me or me and zio or me and avon i don't know if you two hang out by yourself but maybe it is you two we just we've talk never, this is now. kind of we're, net this is the first time we've like instant bffs now yeah Aww. <laughs> we both like all (laughs) we discovered yeah (laughs) excellent um well okay so I know we've been chatting 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 uh kind of about this topic but I also want to ask a question we can obviously go back to the letter too I I don't know if we really uh I mean answer the question but she's in the right she's like doing the thing that she should be doing so I don't know what other do yeah I want to be like you're great don't yeah 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 keep loving like the way that you love yeah yeah. Okay, cool. Well, then I, I will segue into, um, so we, we, we often try to have our second part of our podcast be sort of relating this theme to like writer stuff or romance stuff mm-hmm. or whatever. So um, today's chat topic is about the grovel in <laughs> specifically in uh, books, romance books. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of them. Romance, you write some. Um, <laughs> but if you, in case you really love this podcast because you were a fan of advice, but you don't read romance, uh, the grovel is like there's a point in a romance novel where one lover has either wronged or uh, not given the other what they they need, and so they beg and plead and make or make like a grand gesture, uh, like a huge apology to win back the heart of the one that they love. Right. Um, do you write the grovel? Do you like the grovel? What are your thoughts about the grovel? <laughs> you know, I can't say that I do write that a lot. I The thought of people not communicating well gives me hives, which I understand <laughs> is hard to like live in lo- the world this way. But my, like, I, I'm a big fan of like external conflict, but I did, in Eden, we did have a slightly dramatic grovel where the one character didn't stand up for their love interest at a certain time and then years later when they get back when they get together he does make an effort to do something and what I like is less like words and more like action so like mm-hmm. give me the, like that say anything you know with the yeah like, I was just thinking that <laughs> Gen X are coming out but like like some sort of like I want like an activity or an action or that they phys- like do something um because mm-hmm. sometimes words I'll just be like oh no I'll just cry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah I don't I don't know that I do the grovel the way that a lot of romance readers have talked about the grovel because I've seen Mm -hmm. discussion on social media comes up every once in a while or like in a review they say well he didn't do enough he didn't beg enough or she didn't beg enough or whatever and I'm like these are adults like so in in the girl with stars in her eyes you know this bad thing happens between him or he does this really bad thing when they're teenagers and then they meet you know when they're in their late 20s and people wanted him to like beg and plead and grovel and I'm like he was a kid and they said they have a conversation where she's like we were kids like yes I was angry but I realized we were both just kids and they kind of like we move on from there and and people were like he should have done more I'm like what what do you that's perfect you brought it up you did like yeah that's the kind of talking like adults yes talking (laughs) word how dare they yeah not actually (laughs) communicating yeah I'm not a big 
I think a lot of that must come from people that like like misunderstandings. Some people do like that trope. Some people do, and they love the grand gesture to like like that big. I'm so sorry. Here's a hundred roses or whatever it is, which you know it's fine. Makes me, just makes me anxious. <laughs> I agree. I'm not a fan, actually. Okay, so because I'm the biggest nerd in history, I've looked up the dictionary definition and etymology of grovel just out okay. of <laughs> casual interest. Um, so it actually comes from to crawl abjectly on the ground with your face downward, and it's from Old Norse. I do not know how to pronounce. Of course, it, it is. Norse. Yeah, Agluku, face downwards, um, and that's how we get groveling into Middle English from Old Norse, and then into now. So I think that here's my issue with groveling. That uh, gosh, I'm glad it worked out to look up the definition because it's relevant. Sidebar, I used to be an English professor and I never prepared for my discussion sections because, you know, like it's yeah. discussion section and I'm better uh, extemporaneously. And um, what I would sometimes do, though, is like if I didn't immediately know what to, to say or do, I would just have someone look up the definition because it always gives you really good things to talk about. <laughs> um, and like 98% of the time it works, but definitely I had a couple of doozies where the person read the definition and etymology and I was like, interesting it's always great to know about words anyway and I'm like had to really hard <laughs> it because I had no relatives anyway fortunately it's worked out for me well this time here's the thing I don't think that prostration is ever really a satisfying mode of addressing past grievance like it doesn't it's kind of the way like you know how some people if they're they're like someone in their family gets murdered they really want the murderer to like be executed yeah Whereas I'm like, there's nothing about murdering another person that is going to bring that person back or give them peace. This like, it, it is a horrible thought to take away the life of another person. And if you feel that about your own loved one, why would you want to do that yeah. to another family? Even if mm -hmm. the person like, it, it's something that I find just like, like completely inexplicable that wouldn't bring me any peace. Same when people like, you know, you arrest the wrong person for the crime and they're like, but it brings closure to the family. And I'm like, yeah, but like, fake closure, a lie. Why would anyone want that? And I think that I feel the same about the grovel, which is that it's like someone going to an extreme to negate themselves in order to like prove to you that you should want them. And I'm like, I don't want a negated person. I want a whole present mm -hmm. person who has like taken the thing that they learned and the thing that they did, they did wrong and grown from it and become yes. like, a, a stronger, more useful, better person in the world, which is why I feel like the grovel, I mean, I also think it happens a little bit more in, in het romance, which I don't really read very yeah. much because there's a, a lot of gendered stuff about it, I think, which is like men, I'm using air quotes in every word, like men are intrinsically strong. And so them placing themselves on their knees has more yeah. value than women who are naturally weak and submissive, because if they grovel, then it's just their natural state, right? It's yeah. huge air quotes over the whole thing. So to me, it's just like, it's a bit sexist. It's a bit misogynist. And it doesn't like, I don't find it attractive. Like oh, I can't I think of anything less attractive, frankly, than someone being like, I'm a worm, step on me. Not those actual <laughs> words, that would be hilarious, <laughs> but um, the sentiment. So yeah, I'm sure that there are tons of authors who do it really well. And I just don't read them because I don't read that many of that type of romance, but I don't think I've ever written one. I've definitely written like accidental self-embarrassment. Uh, or like grand gestures, which I do enjoy, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not a fan. Yeah. yeah, I'm more of a fan of the grand gesture than I am of the grovel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like if there's, I like it when if they did something wrong, because this is how I like real life. If somebody, no one's perfect, and then an opportunity, if the, some situation arises, and the person acts in a way that shows they have learned from the past thing, <laughs> and they do it correctly or correctly. I'm gonna use their quotes now. The next time, to me, that is 100% more romantic because it shows I listened to your concerns. I recognized what I did wrong and I changed behavior and did the right thing. To me, that's like swoon. I love that. Yeah, but it yeah. doesn't. And I write like kink novels. My fantasy series has like bio kink. So people are constantly like, like maybe going to their knees, but in a sexy way. Yeah, not totally not different. Way. Yeah. Right. I do right. like the, the trope when, well, not trope, but the moment when something embarrassing ha happens to character A in order to show solidarity and support character B does the same thing to embarrass yeah. themselves so yeah. they're not embarrassed alone I love that yeah. I think that's yeah. like a really gesture of love more than the grovel I have to say there's yeah. other mm -hmm. things the grovel is just at the bottom of the list for me 
I totally agree. I also like what, what Ava, what you were saying about communication. I think like, mm -hmm. because I cannot stand miscommunication, like <laughs> I constantly end my, I end my books, like every chapter, because every chapter I'm like, oh, they had a problem. Oh, look, all they did is literally say two sentences. And because they were honest, communicative sentences, the problem is ameliorated instantly. Well, guess I'll do it again in another chapter. And yeah. like, it's actually very difficult, I think, to write one of my characters like doing something so bad that they would need to grovel that also couldn't have been avoided through healthy communication. It's actually like, I'm trying to think it's, it's a huge challenge and it would probably require like some machinations, uh, but I also just don't enjoy it. Like, yeah, I, lo I mean, I love some angst. I love some, I'm like literally incapable of giving you what you want. I, I mean, I love all of these things because they're character traits right they're like yeah. about people's personalities but um yeah miscommunication which like gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you're in a situation where a person would have to grovel uh, yeah it, it, it almost never happens in my books I don't even know how I would write it I think yeah. the only place I've seen it um is in bully romances like the bully redemption arc where the bully oh, does yeah. something in high school or whatever it was and then they have to make you have to prove to the person that they're they've changed and so there's a lot of like not I mean I've seen some groveling but a lot of it's yeah. just like the proof of like I'm not that person that I was and, you know that I, kind of thing but we are writing a fantasy series that I was discussing that had like um gods finding companions and like in the second one it's like the um he's like the I guess um uh, what's the word I'm looking for manifestation of like avarice and mm -hmm. there is a thing that he has to do something to show that like, it's like, you know, human desire that's been corrupted by people wanting like a crown or, you know, cause it's fantasy. So you can kind of like use magic and these kind of grander sweeping, like I burned down an empire for you. And I feel like that's a little bit less realistic. I mean, obviously it's less realistic. <laughs> it's less realistic. Real. You know, I don't know how many people have burned an empire for y'all, but like six, seven and ashes over here. But, but like, it's a little bit easier when you can take the realm, I guess, of like, realism and make it like I'm really just mad because you didn't trust me and you tried to fix a problem instead of asking me like if you show me that in a fantasy situation with I'm burning down this empire out of like rage like I'm much more like likely to go with that than yeah. like I was mean to you in high school and now I'm gonna be nice to you. I don't know why that is though like if some tropes just work better for me if it's in a fantasy setting than it is a realistic one so right. I have a question for you guys that's sort of along these lines how do you feel about the grand sacrifice when it comes to romance. Can you or give like, me examples or definitions? Okay, so there's like a joke, you know, about all the Hallmark movies where the girl is like a big city something. Oh and yeah. She moves to the small, goes back to her small town and falls for the guy. And then she has to give up her big city, whatever. To, or like, you know, where some one character is giving up something that they mm -hmm. thought was important to them in order to be with the other character. How do you feel about those? That's a good question. Good question. Yeah, I think that um, to me, it's kind of, it's a bit more case specific, but mm -hmm. I think that if you're in a relationship and what you're getting out of the relationship is something that's super nurturing and nourishing, then I wouldn't consider it a sacrifice. I would consider it a choice. And that's all the yeah. difference. That makes all the difference to me is like, yeah. if you are giving up one thing, but you are gaining something equal to or greater than that, it's not really a sacrifice. It's just a shift. And if you don't, maybe if, if you're like, you're giving up something that you used to think you wanted, it's also because suddenly upon meeting like a new person and falling in love, you realize that they are giving you or allowing you to give yourself the things that that other external thing used to give you like confidence or mm -hmm. whatever. And then like, it's not so much that it's a sacrifice. It's that you've learned something about yourself and you don't need that thing anymore. So you're giving yeah. up something that has like lost its value now that that value has been filled in another area. Yeah, it makes me think of your Rex and Daniel. Oh, yeah. Right, where he's like, I'm in this place. I love this place. This is my place. And it's like, well, <laughs> trying to just, I'm, trying, I'm, sorry, I'm speaking vaguely in case anyone hasn't read the book. Oh, yeah, spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> spoiler alert. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think moving is a really good example because that's a common one in mm -hmm. like adult yeah. life is if you need a job or whatever. But I'm also like, yeah, I think that um, moving gets recontextualized when you reach a certain age, when you're in a different romantic category and like when you are single, the place that you exist matters more because you're all, if you are someone seeking love or, or sex or relationships, you're like looking at it as 
the environment from which you have to find a person or people to give you mm -hmm. those things. And so it feels really important. And then I think that actually shifts a bit when you're in a relationship and, and you, you know that you, or you're moving home, like where you have a family and older friends, like, you know, that suddenly you're not dependent on your environment to like, just mm -hmm. give you all the people that you would need. And yeah. so it becomes much less important. And you're like, oh, I've moved home. And and in, you know, and then in the Hallmark movies, I feel like the friends are always like, but wait, what are you going to do that your favorite salad at your favorite bar? You're never going to have it again. The person's yeah, like, the lattes at the I shop. love my husband more now? than salad. You know, it's like, <laughs> I can have other things. <laughs> oh my gosh. I did make a lot of my, like, in some of my hockey romances, I would have like a player decide to like in save the game when Ethan's like, I think I'm done playing hockey now. Cause I found another thing that will keep me here with you, Riley. And like, will allow me to be with you, but also do something for kids and yeah, something yeah. involved. Like, so it's like giving up one thing because new opportunities have opened up for you in whatever way to me is a little different than like, I always wonder with some of those Hallmark movies and I love a good Hallmark cheesy Christmas movie as much as anyone. <laughs> But at the end, I'm like, what's going to happen to you in like a year? If you're yeah. like, oh no, my in went under. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, are you really going to be happy? Like, did you really think this through? And I think that's why sometimes I'm like, contemporary is hard for me to read a lot of things because I need my suspension of disbelief. But then I'm like, it's just a story. You can just read it and be like, oh, that's so romantic. But you, if you think a little too much about two years from now, you know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. With some of those, it's like you gave up everything for on a whim which I mean maybe that works out for some people but I don't know I can buy it if it's a second chance thing yeah more so than meeting someone you know for the first time and then just throwing your entire life away to be with them <laughs> you know, like well, okay I'll, I'll give a counter example from my own life though I think sometimes it's we're very quick to be like you were giving up your whole life or throwing away your whole life when like That's as true. someone as someone who who uh by myself on a whim like got rid of all my possessions and moved to new orleans where i knew one person I mean, and I uh <laughs> you know like i just I, I i didn't feel like i was giving up or throwing anything away i felt yeah. like i would i had wanderlust i wanted to explore i was not yeah. happy where i was i knew that i wanted something and i didn't know what it was and i needed like something, mm -hmm. something new. It was like, I needed an injection of newness to understand like what I wanted. And I think it's, it's, um, yeah, there's like a branding problem with giving up your whole life to move to the country. If you could just start saying like, I have discarded a life that was no longer serving me in order to try this new thing. And I think, I think what you said that was important there is you weren't happy. I did the same thing yeah, when I moved yeah. here. I moved from a place where I wasn't happy. I knew one person and I just kind of thought, why not? I'm, you know, I was 19 at the time. I might as well try it out. And I've been super happy, but that was the thing is we, like, if you didn't like where you were, it's different in these movies. Yes. And I think that is kind of how they're framed. Like she thinks they got she everything they all. wanted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they don't really, really which happy, which yeah. sometimes I'm a little, like, it does get a little like a cliche to the point of like it's always a, a woman with a job and a high-powered city and yes. like, but she doesn't really want that well what if she does though yeah they do it over yeah. and over and yeah. over and over yes again. well and that's my problem is it's so patronizing they always have the voiceover yeah. from a man that's like she had everything she wanted but nothing she really needed <laughs> and you're like well cool, I love that it's your choice what she really needs yeah narrator, narrator. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Well, yes. this has all been extremely on topic. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's great. It was a um, great, great discussion though. Um, yeah. yeah. So thank you for- Well, I'm really curious also here. if people have thoughts about the grovel question and the yeah, grand sacrifice question. I would really love to hear what people- Me too. We should put yeah. up a poll. <laughs> we should. Let's put up a poll on Twitter. Uh, yeah. To yeah. Relevant to this, this episode because I'm curious. Yeah. yeah. We'll do that and then you guys can chime in and we can you know revisit at another time when avery's here i'm sure she's got thoughts because I, I think just, she writes i think she does the grovel i was gonna say i feel like i would wager money that avery loves a grovel yeah I've, you've read quite a bit of avery's work and i think she is a fan of the grovel so well well darn she should have been here yeah oh. avery no <laughs> oh my gosh well thank you so much Avon for being here we oh really my gosh thanks for having me it was had so a great fun. time yeah it was a lot of fun um tell everybody again about your stuff your books what they're what's coming out you want them to read well you just had a release so yes uh, Eden? it's called yes, Eden so 
It's called Eden and it was co-written with my friend Emily Rossman and it was her first book. So it's very cute because she keeps asking me like, what are the, um, how many people have bought it? And then she's like, that many people want to read it? It's really fun. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, congratulations, yeah. Emily. Yeah, congratulations, is, Emily. That's awesome. She is enjoying it. And then my other series is um, the one I'm like all gone for, like my brain obsessive. Um, I'm writing with Faye Loxley and it is, uh, we have two completed series and we're starting our third one, which is called Immortals Descending. And the first one of that one comes out in October. And you can follow me at uh, Avon Gale Writes on Twitter or Iris Foxglove. Wait, is it Iris? <laughs> I'm so glad I know this. <laughs> I'm like, is it Iris Foxglove author or? Iris Fox Glove. It's just Iris Fox Glove on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, Iris sorry. Fox Glove Demon. We'll make yeah. sure we put that up on our on our show notes so that people can yes, find we'll you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. So glad that we finally got you on. And you. uh listeners, guess who we love? I love my sister, my cat. No, I'm just kidding. It's you. Um, <laughs> you know what we would also really love is if you would send us some questions. Uh, and you can do that in several ways. And Zio definitely remembers your email address of what one of those ways is. No, I got it. I got it. You got it's it? Okay. <laughs> at dearromancewriter.com. Yes. Yes. The fact that I finally got this the one day Avery wasn't here to make fun of me for <laughs> fucking it up is just my life. But yes. So advice at dearromancewriter.com. No, it, at gmail. No, dear romance writer. It's at dearromancewriter.com. Why did I second guess myself? Or you can go to dearromancewriter.com and we have like a form. Uh, you can be completely anonymous, send yeah. out your thing, or you can DM us on any of the social media platforms where we are, Dear Romance Writer on all of them. Anyway, I just know you have problems. I know you. <laughs> we all I have know. problems, especially right now. I know. Yeah, right now. I know you have problems. Mm. You're a person and we all do. And I just feel like if you could share, like donate, think of this as charity just donate some of your problems to our inbox and we'll take care of them for you we'll just talk about them we will give you questionable advice we'll just you know like all the things so yeah you know what you have to do listeners <laughs> thank you um yeah so send us all the questions and we cannot wait to offer you more questionable advice from this trio of happily ever after enthusiasts goodbye for now Thank you so much for subscribing to Dear Romance Writer. Remember to keep sending in those letters at dearromancewriter.com. We can't wait to tell you what to do. Dear Romance Writer is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love, frolic.media slash podcasts.